the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to John the Apostle, also referred to as the Beloved Disciple, chapter 12, starting in verse 23, and I'll read through verse 30. And today, I would like to speak to you about when God speaks, when God speaks. This is a title, a topic, like many others from the Word of God, that cannot be exhausted. Um, it's a title, a thought, um, that goes in many different directions. I'm going to take you in one particular direction today, but it's not limited to that direction, okay? So John chapter 12, starting in verse 23, reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And even before I go on in verse 24, Jesus was speaking concerning, and I like to give a little bit of background on it, uh, some background on it. Um, the Bible says at this time here in John um, that Jesus was initially reaching out to the, the Jews, the Jewish population, but Others were hearing about the goodness and the grace of Almighty God, and therefore they were coming and they were inquiring, and they had needs, so therefore they were inquiring of this uh, concerning this healer, this miracle worker. Because, brothers and sisters, as we deal with people, as we talk to people, as we deal with people, as we're involved in the community of people, we find out, we learn that everyone has needs. Um, everyone is dealing with something. Doesn't matter what your nationality is, doesn't matter what your race is. Um, as, a, as mature adults, older and mature adults, we have children, we have grandchildren, that's across every nationality, every race, and there are challenges in all of our lives. So here in John chapter 12, previously before verse 23, the Greeks and the, Gen the Greeks, the Gentiles, they were reaching out. They were inquiring concerning Jesus because, again, they had needs as well. So... That's kind of the background on this particular setting here. So again, in verse 23, chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come, or actually these G's, these G Gentiles, these Greeks, they came to the festivities in Jerusalem. They said, we would see Jesus. They asked the disciples, sirs, we would see Jesus. We want to hear we want to see, we want to talk to this man named Jesus who, is, who has performed miracles, who cares, who's compassionate, etc., etc., etc. They said, we would see Jesus. And in that statement being made, Jesus replies here in verse 23. And this, this reply is prophetical for that particular time. Uh, prophetical in the sense that Jesus had not died on the cross. Jesus had not rose again. Prophetical in the sense that after his death, burial, and resurrection, salvation, not that it was closed to everyone, but salvation through the grace of God, God's riches at Christ's expense, salvation based on John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world, the entire human race, regardless of nationality, regardless of creed, regardless of background, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the statement that Jesus is making in verse 23 is prophetical, prophetical in the sense that it's going to fulfill John 3, 16, 
it's it's going to uh, bring the human race into a state of grace, a dispensation or a time period of grace. Um, it's prophetical in the sense that the uh, the family of God will be open to every nationality, every race, every creed. There's no discrimination. There's no separation. So it's prophetical in that sense. Verse 23. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour or the time has come that the son of man, again, son of man, son of humanity should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Again, these are prophetical statements leading up to the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So Jesus is using this, as I read it, He's using this as a teaching opportunity for his disciples at that time as well. Verse 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So again, it's prophetical and not to make the word all theological or anything. I'll just break it down. It's that foretelling or foreshadowing. If any man serve me, he should also be following me. So if I'm a servant of God, I'm also a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And Jesus said, when that person, anyone, opening door for all nationalities, race, creeds, people, it's not exclusive to the Jewish nation. It's open, it's inclusive to all the human race. He says, my father will honor them, all right? So verse 27, so he, he gives them this explanation, this prophetical, this foretelling, this foreshadowing of the grace of God and the acceptance and the honor from the Father for the entire human race who make a decision or anyone in the human race to make a decision to live for Jesus. Then he goes on in verse, 20, <clears throat> verse 27 and he says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Because now, and let me just use that as a teaching moment. So he's saying, this is what the family of God is going to look like. Just a summary. Every nation, every race, every creed of, of the human race will be represented, can be represented. Salvation is open to whosoever believeth in me, right? So he lays the foundation. He lets the disciples, as well as you and I, see what the family of God looks like. Now he brings them to the point, said this is what it looks like, but this is what it's going to take to get there. So now he goes into, my soul is troubled. What was he referring to when he said his soul is troubled? The word soul, as it is defined in the Psalms, as it is defined when we're first introduced to the word in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says God breathed into man, so the Spirit of God breathed into the nostrils of this formation of clay that God chose to call man, and it became a living soul. So we're introduced to the word soul there in the Bible in Genesis chapter two, verse seven. And in introducing that word, it defines it for us. The word soul is defined as the seat or the meaning of it. You have a soul, I have a soul. 
you and I, mankind, all of us, doesn't matter, again, nationality, race, creed, uh, the composites or the components of every person is what? A body, a physical body, a spirit, and a soul. Doesn't matter who you are, your background. You have a body, spirit, and a soul. The body, we know, was formed from the dust of the ground. Again, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The spirit of God... The Bible says again, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, breathe into the body, the formation of the body. And as a result of those two components coming together, the spirit breathed life into the body. And that life is called or contains the soul. The soul is the seat of our emotions, the center of of our emotions, the seat, the center of our appetites, the seat, the center of our passions. So oftentimes our soul is in, that's why right when we read the Psalms, he refers to the soul is in trouble. My soul is in conflict. My soul rejoice. So the seat of his emotions, the seat of his appetites, the seat or the center of his passions. So when you Think about that. My soul is in trouble. My soul rejoice, be it positive or negative, where it's referring to that inner man, right? That inner man, that inner person is rejoicing. That inner person is feeling uh, uh, excited or discouraged, the soul. So God reaches out to our soul. And, and we know that to be true. There's a number of references. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, Chapter 4 talks about the word of God is quick, is powerful, even to the dis dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. So the soul and the spirit are so closely connected because the soul doesn't exist without the spirit, right? So they're so closely connected, but yet they're separate. We know they're separate because Jesus makes reference to him. He says, when you serve God, love God and serve God with all your strength, all your might, all your soul, all your spirit. So it's, it's defined throughout the Bible that it's distinguishedly different, but it's also necessary. And it's a part of us, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Every man, every woman is made up of that. And the enemy, he attacks our soul. If you notice, especially in the religious community, it says, you know, the devil, he doesn't attack our spirit. He attacks our soul. He makes appeals for our soul, the seat of our appetites, our emotions, our all those things. Even in Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he, he made an appeal to his soul. If thou be the son of God, right? That's the spiritual reference. He made reference the son of God. We know that God is a spirit. John chapter 4, Jesus talking to the uh, Samaritan woman. So the devil made an appeal to Jesus' spirit. He says, if thou be divine, if thou be the son of God, you're in a spirit beating. Then he made an appeal to the soul. Turn these rocks into bread. The seed of your appetites. I know you're hungry. You fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So I'm sharing that with you just to be aware. Be aware as you navigate through life, recognize and realize that the enemy, the devil is the enemy of our soul. He makes attacks on our soul, our appetites, our emotions, all these things that cause us to go up and down, our uh, center of our excitement, our joy, but also our souls are vulnerable. So just a little FYI, be aware. So Jesus said here, my soul is in trouble. So now we have to, to fully understand that. We also have to go back up to the reference that the Bible makes. It says here, the son of man, verse 23, the hour is come, the time is come that the son of man. So he's also showing us there in verse 23 
that when he refers to the son of man, he's referring to the son of humanity and humanity is subject to time. So he equates an hour which associated with time because we know that Jesus Christ, the son of God, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, they're eternal. So they're not subjected to time. So as we read our Bible and study our Bible, these words are significant. These words are important, how they're laid out in the scriptures. The hour is come, the time is come, and maybe in other translations they put the word time in there, um, but the time is come. What do you mean the time? That the Son of Man, the Son of Man is subjected to that hour. The Son of Man is subjected to time. So with that being said, going down, he says, Okay, the hour has come that the Son of Man, humanity, is subjected to this time. My soul is in trouble. Again, the seed of my appetites, my emotions. So let's look at it emotionally. The time has come that my soul, my emotions are troubled. And what shall I say? What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, save me from this time, save what? Save humanity from this time? No. Then he answers the question in the spirit realm, right? He answered it from a divine point of view. So he's making references from a humanity point of view, as well as a divinity point of view. He says, my soul is troubled. That's a humanity point of view. And then he says, what shall I say? Now he's going into a divinity point of view. For this cause I came. This is the whole reason I came. I came to be crucified. I came to die. I came to be buried. I came to resurrect for the salvation of humanity. All right? So he says, if uh, my soul is now troubled, the reference, uh, humanity perspective, and what shall I say? It shifts over to a divine uh, perspective. Father, save me from this hour. Save me from this time. No. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. I was born into the world. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the flesh, made under the law. For what reason? So that he could come, live as a man, live in this body, this body die and go through that whole process. And maybe this is perfect leading up to Easter and leading up to the resurrection, right? All right, let's move on. Verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by heard it and said that it thundered. And others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. So I want to speak to you, and I know I've already shared a lot with you. But I want to speak to you about when God speaks, when God speaks. Here in this Bible reading, and I've shared and I'm, I'm not going to reiterate it, share with you a number of things as I was going down the scriptures. In this particular Bible reading, in these few verses of scripture, in verse 29, it really shows us the Father speaking, right? Talks about the Father speaking, or even before verse 29, how the Father spoke in verse 28, right? He says, there a voice came from heaven, and it says, I have both glorified thee, uh, both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. But truly, we read God speaking, God the Son speaking, and God the Father speaking throughout the entirety of the Bible. Let me read some scriptures to you 
reference Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, just a few here. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times, again, King James, at sundry times, or at specific times, and in diverse manners, or many ways, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. So God, just layman terms, God in former times, in past times, he spoke to the forefathers using mankind. Not only mankind, but God uses many ways to speak. I preached a message years ago concerning the day the animals preach. God spoke through the animals that boarded the ark. And all those people were watching. What did God speak using the animals boarding the ark? God's message to man was, these animals that I created, they are obedient to the voice of God, unlike mankind, whom I also created in my image, will not hear my voice, nor will obey. So God uses many different things to speak to us but I'm going to associate the word primarily the word of God. So he goes on in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. He goes on, he says, Now in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. So the emphasis being the word of God. Jesus is the word. The Bible tells us John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And we know in various other places in the Bible, Revelation being specific, um, it says that Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the means, the primary means by which God communicates with mankind. God the Father speaks to you and I through his Son, who is the Word, who's also the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning of the uh, Greek alphabet, in which the New Testament is translated from, to the ending, the Alpha and the Omega. He's every letter in the alphabet, and it takes letters to make up a word, and it takes words to communicate. So Jesus is every letter in the alphabet. Therefore, he has the authority to create words and as a, having authority to create words, he uses the words to communicate to humanity. So he is the word of God. He is the alpha and the omega and it's by him and through him, the father communicates with us. He speaks to us. So Hebrews chapter one, verse two, it says in these last days, now, I know that I hear a number of people in the Christian community says these are the last days because uh, there's rumors of wars. No, it's not rumor of wars. There's wars. There's earthquakes. No, it's not. <laughs> there's earthquakes happening. There's earthquakes that have been happening since back in Genesis chapter 6 in the days of Peleg or one of those chapters in the days of Peleg when the earth divided. So these natural catastrophes that happen they've been happening and war has been going on since Cain slew his brother Abel so the point I'm making here is that oftentimes within the religious community we want to use all these signs of the times and says God is speaking to us when truly God speaks to us through the word of God as he said here in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 especially verse two, God in these last days has spoken to us through his son, who is the word of God. All right. And then in Matthew chapter three, Matthew chapter three, verse 17. And this, what I'm going to read to you here, it's also referenced nine other times, or excuse me, seven other, seven other times, let's say seven, the complete number in these very similar, if not exact words, exact or similar words. Starting here in Matthew 3, 17, it reads this. And lo, a voice came from heaven saying, 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Again, throughout the four gospels, those words exact or similar, maybe a, a little variation of, of words within that sentence in that verse change a little bit, but it's the same meaning. We read them seven times, placing emphasis. God said, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, the earthly mother of Jesus, she said it again in John chapter two. She says, this is my son, hear him. So the point I'm making here is that God speaks. When God speaks, he uses his son in these last days. The point I'm making is that there is a great need for the word of God. There is a great necessity and there should be a great emphasis on the word of God to dive into, to read, to study, to hear, to accept, to apply the word of God in our daily lives because God speaks to us in these last days through his son who is the word of God. All right, so now let's go back to John chapter 12, verse 23. Shared a number of things with you already, but let's just go through it um, for a few moments here, for a few minutes here. So John chapter three, Jesus spoke, he's speaking. The Bible says Jesus answering them. Again, I gave you the background. The Greeks came, the Gentiles came, and they said to the disciples, Sir, we would see Jesus. We're not just coming here for a festival. We're not just coming here to be entertained. We're not just coming here to eat, Lord. We're not just coming here to go through the motions. And brothers and sisters, we shouldn't just be going to church. We shouldn't just be going to Bible studies. We shouldn't just be doing these things just to go through the motions. When we go to church, when we read our Bible, when we go to Bible studies, we should go, we, including myself, we should go with the intent, with the purpose, God speak to my heart. God challenge me through your word. Lord, open my eyes, reveal to me from your word through the power of your spirit what you want me to do in my life. I don't need to hear it from another man. I don't need to hear it from, I'm looking to your word that you laid out for me in my life. All right? So Jesus, when the Gentiles came, the Greeks, we would see Jesus. That should be the testimony of every born again believer. When I go to a church event, we would see Jesus. And I'm trying not to interject my opinion as often, but I just wonder if traditionally we've gone and gone to church services and picnics and on and on and all these events and shows at the church and all this. But was it with the intent we would see Jesus? We've had the men's day. We had the women's day. We had all these things. But were they, did they have the tent? Was the purpose that people would see Jesus? Or was it just for people to stand up and be recognized? First, giving honor to God. Okay, giving honor to God, you should stop. Now I'm going to give honor to this one and give honor to that one and give honor to this one. And give. And before you know it, where's God? Where's we would see Jesus? We didn't give honor to everyone else, equating everyone else on the same level as God, in the same sentence as God. Are you with me? equating everyone else in the same sentence as God with God. So now people after service, they're talking about sister so-and-so. They're talking about brother so-and-so. They're talking about minister so-and-so. And they should be talking about Jesus. God speaks to us through Jesus. So Jesus answering, Jesus said, the time has come, the hour has come that the Son of Man be, may be glorified. 
So in verse 24, here's the message to man. Here's the message to man. He says, verily, verily, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it, it abides alone. He was letting them know, number one, the message to man is humility. Humility. In this particular verse, you can live a self, selfish life, but you're going to remain alone. You can live an isolated life or have a very small network of people that you talk to on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, what have you, but that's it. It's going to be contained in that small, small group. And I'm not saying that's wrong or right. It's not my life. But if that's what you choose, but unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, so humbling ourselves, seeing our need, allowing God to speak to us through his word. He says, you're going to abide alone. And being alone, this is my opinion. I'm going to insert this from my experience. Being alone, you're more subjected to depression. You're more subjected to discouragement. You can lock yourself in a room. You can isolate yourself. But now the only voice you're hearing is your own voice. You're more subjected to depression, discouragement, despair. And not only is the individual subjected to that, that network of people, however small it might be, they're going to be the recipients of all your complaining, all your blaming, all your discouragement, because you're going to get on the phone and call them, and you're going to, it's only three or four people or whatever, and you're going to tell them all about your problems. Isn't the song says, tell Jesus all about your problems? He will hear your fainted cry, right? He will answer you by and by. Have a little talk with Jesus. No, we have a little talk with that network of people. Because, We've done that to ourselves. That's the message to men. It takes humility to come to Jesus. It takes humility to go and reach out and, and, and be a part of the human race. It's easier to live a selfish life. But Jesus' message to man is to live a selfless life. And then what are the results of a selfless life? What are the results of a humble heart, a humble life? He says, but if it die, in this particular verse, if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So these are the results. The results are produce or production. The results are he who hath friends shows himself friendly. The results are, it goes from discourage, a discouraged mentality to an encouraged mentality. It goes from despair and all those other negative things that the soul is troubled by to being encouraged and uplifted. So Jesus' message, God, when God speaks, he's speaking a message to mankind as we look at these scriptures, as we look at the word of God. He's speaking to us to help us. But in order to hear it, one has to humble themselves and stop saying you know it all. Stop saying you are familiar with these scriptures. That is an indication of pride. We only know what we apply. We only know what we walk in. We only know what we live in. All right. Then he goes on in verse 25. He says, he who, who loved his life shall lose it. And he who hated his life, disliked his life in the world. I call this the biological life. We were born into the world. We didn't have a choice. Uh, but now as we're born, as we develop, as we go out, we have a choice if we're going to network with people. We have a choice if we're going to reach out. We have a choice if we're going to have friends. We have, we as human beings make that daily decision what we're going to do with our lives, what we're going to eat, how long we're going to sleep. We 
are in control of our lives. And people are on such this hang up, I call it a hang up, of control, control, control. Control your appetite. Control your diet. You want so much control? Get internal control. All right. That was free. <laughs> so he that love his life shall lose it. And he that hated his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. So again, the eternal fruit, the eternal, not just today. So I'm not proud of the life I lived before Jesus. Those were chapters in my lives. I, in my life, I learned from them, but I don't walk around and say, oh, I was this and I was that. No, that was a chapter I want to close. That's a chapter that's in the history books or history, history chapters in my life. I don't want to relive them because now a Christian should be saying, I'm a new creature in God. All right. So God speaks to us and he speaks in some message to mankind, a message. And he goes on and he talks about in verse 26, he starts talking about duties and servitude. He says, if any man serve me. So again, God's speaking. And you notice, I'm not talking about God speaking to me just to tell you. He's, he's speaking to me about Douglas E. Perkins. Your duties, your responsibility to me. He's speaking to you about your responsibility to him. He says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. So just walking around, running around saying, I'm a servant of God. Are you following him? Are you a disciple? Yeah, I'm a disciple. That word disciple comes from the same root word of discipline. So if the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart concerning some, some, some areas that need discipline in your life, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that for the greater good and service for God? Because serving God is one thing. Following him is another. They two, the two should layer over each other and should become one. But I wonder if people in word, I'm serving God, but then I don't want to discipline myself in this Christian life. How do you separate them? How do you separate them? So if any man serve me, Jesus said, these are the words of our Lord Jesus, the one you say you accepted, the one you say you love. These are his words. This, this is him speaking. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Not, not Doug Perkins. Jesus said, if you serve him, follow him. And he says, where I am, here's the results. Here's the blessings. Where I am, there shall also be my servant. If any man serve me, he said, the father will honor him. The Father will honor those who make a decision to serve and follow Jesus. Well, how do I please the Father? Serve and follow His Son. Isn't that the message to mankind? Serve and follow Jesus. He said, if any... He's not a respecter of persons. There's That scripture opens up Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 13. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever will, any man of any nationality, of any race, of any creed, of any background, you make that decision to live for Jesus, to follow Jesus, to discipline yourself for Jesus, the Father will honor you. Do we want to win the Father, Father God over? Follow Jesus, his son. Serve Jesus, his son. This is what Jesus said. Jesus is speaking to us. The Bible takes away every excuse that we have. Well, Preacher Williams, well, Preacher Johnson, well, Preacher this, are you following them? Or are you following Jesus? Did they save you or did Jesus save you?
so God's message to us, he speaks to us through the word of God. Speaks to us through the word of God. Now let's go down to verse 27. We have Jesus' testimony, personal testimony, and his responsibility and accountability. Jesus' personal testimony of his responsibility to mankind. Notice what he said. Now my soul is troubled. So like you and I, who experience things internally, emotionally, our appetites, our passions, our soul is troubled, our soul is being challenged. Jesus said it here, my soul is troubled. The human side of me is troubled. But what shall I say? Father, save me? Shall I say, Father, just save me from this? Appeal to my soul, appeal to my emotions, appeal to my passions, appeal to, to, to my appetites, appeal to all these things. As a parent, for us parents out there, did you appeal to everything your child asked of you? Everything? Every uprising or downsetting? Or did you want them to learn something? I'm just posing that question because people parent differently. And even us in our age, our adult children, do you appeal to everything they ask? Oh, I want better for them. Sometimes discipline is better for them. Sometimes allowing them to walk through certain things so that they can create their own identity as well as so that they can depend on God. So that they can hear God speaking to them. Mothers and fathers, how can God speak? I mean, God can speak and does speak to them, but how can they hear God if you're God to them? We, we want revival. We want, we want God intervening in our lives, in our nation, in the world, but yet, we won't move out of God's way. We want God to save our children. We want God to speak to our children. He's trying. He loves them more than we do. But the question is, when God speaks to them in various ways, diverse manners, do we step in and cut off the voice of God? Well, I don't want to see them go through anything. That's your soul. But what about their soul? Our soul is trying to protect their soul, and it may be damaging them. Because when you die and I die, and they live on, yeah, I don't want to think about that. Well, start thinking about it. Because God is speaking to us to prepare us through his word today for tomorrow, be it our lives or our children's lives. That's where that humility comes in. You know, people don't like hearing this, say, from a preacher. They don't like hearing it. They get all tight. Parents get all tight. But get tight with God. Get tight with the one who saved you because it's him speaking. It's his word. Why get tight and why get upset with the deliverer of the word versus the author of the word? That's where we need to check ourselves. All right. I don't know why I'm going all of this. It's not on my paper. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows because we are living in crisis times. And all that religious saying, oh, God will work it out. Yes, he will. But he uses people to work it out. And he uses his word. And he's speaking to us. So if God is using his word to speak to me and I'm not yielding to his word, why do I think he's going to work it out? I'm not willing to allow God to speak to me through his word, but yet I'm depending on him to work it out. That's about as oxymoron as jumbo shrimp, right? <laughs> anyway, Jesus' personal testimony and his responsibility. My soul is troubled, but what shall I say? Father, deliver me. Deliver the human side of me. Deliver me. I don't want to go through this. Even though I know the greater good is for the salvation of souls. I know that my temporal trouble 
will produce eternal gain, deliver me? No, Jesus, notice the word as God speaks to you and I through his word, notice what he says. He says, but for this cause, I came. Let me ask every mother out there, when you gave birth to your child or your children, was it your intent not only to raise them, but to make every decision for them for the rest of their entire lives? Was it your intent to live for them versus allowing them to live for themselves for the, the rest of their lives? Was it your intent to be involved with everything they do, everything they eat, everything they say, every place they go for their entire lives? That's a question. You say, well, I never thought about it like that, but are your actions reflective of that? Are your actions reflective of that? They may be, and I'm not judging you, but what I, what I will say to you, if that is your course of action right now, how do you expect the God of heaven, how do you expect Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, to speak to them and for them to respond? You can go whichever route you want to go, but when their soul is troubled, when their needs supersede what you can give to them, even your words of comfort, that's good, that's positive, that's wonderful, that's parental. But when that doesn't help, when they need a word from God, think about that, all right? So Jesus said, for this cause, I'm not going to ask my father, should I say, Father, save me from this hour, save me from this time, save me from this trouble? No, it was for this cause I came. Even though I don't like it, even though it's inconvenient, even though it's uncomfortable, this was the reason, this was the purpose I came. As a parent, this is why I raised you to be an adult. I didn't raise you to be an adolescent all your life a youth all your life, I raised you, hopefully, uh, to the best of my knowledge, to the, uh, the best of the resources that I had available to be an adult, to move and to transition from one stage to the next stage, not to live for you. And you know, really, folks, I don't even know why I'm dealing with this domestic stuff. God knows, the Holy Spirit knows. Really? It doesn't matter, I believe, it doesn't matter who we are. We don't want everyone, we don't want someone else to make all our life decisions. As human beings, I don't think, anyway. All right, so Jesus says, so we, we see the mental state of Jesus, of the upcoming separation, of being separated from his father, leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection, more so the crucifixion and the death. But he says, for this cause I came. I know there's a book out, has been out for years, but the purpose life. What is your purpose in life, Christian? Christian father, Christian mother, Christian. What, what is your purpose in life? Is it just to exist? Is it to follow Jesus? Is it to be a servant of Jesus? Is it to be... Uh, uh, in the place, in the position where we hear God speaking to us through his word. Let's move on here. In verse 28, we have the Father, Jesus and the Father speaking. We have both uh, two of the Trinity. Jesus and the Father. Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. And there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it. How did he glorify it? Through the Son. He glorified his name through his Son. God, as we live for God, we glorify God through our service to God and us following God. 
Jesus said in John chapter 12, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Brothers and sisters, you lift up Jesus in the eyes of your children, your family, by living for Jesus, by serving. It's not behind a pulpit all the time. It's not behind a podium. It's not teaching a Bible study specifically only to those areas, but every Christian in the family of God, we glorify Christ by making a decision to live for him and serve him, following him in the eyes of our family members and others. So Jesus speaks as well as the Father speaks. Jesus said, glorify thy name. The Father said, I have glorified it through you. God shares with us, glorify the name of Jesus by living for him, by obeying his word in the eyes of men. And notice as I come to a conclusion here, in verse 29, Different people heard the same voice, but had different interpretations from where it came. One voice, one sentence, different individuals, different interpretations. Verse 29, the people therefore who stood by heard it and and said, it thundered. Others said, an angel spoke to him. People hear different things based on where they are in their lives. Not only in their lives, in their spiritual walk and or relationship with Jesus and such like. A person can go to church 10, 20, 30, 40 years Attend, attend what they consider faithful. We're not here to judge or determine what a person considers faithful and what not faithful. And let's just say 30, 40 years. And the way they hear things is different from that person they're sitting next to. And they both could have attended at the same time. A husband and wife can both go to church 30, 40 years or whatever. Hear the same exact things and get a, a different interpretation. Because it's dependent on, I believe it's dependent on their spiritual walk, their relationship with Christ, their service to God, their devotion to God their humility, how much are they yielding to the voice of God as he speaks to them? So the hearers, the hearers, some said, it thundered. It was God speaking. Just like God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Was that thunder? Was that a voice of the angel? This was, Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. And the Father said, I have glorified it through you. And the people who heard it says, oh, it's thundering. Others said, an angel is speaking to him. It was like, was there anyone there who realized this was the Father? I'm going to close with this, this statement, this sentence, uh, this scripture. In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus went into the area of Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus looked around and he saw all these busts, right? Bust of this Caesar and this governor and this, this, this state official. And, he's, and he, he looked at his disciples there in Matthew 16, and he said, whom do men say that I am? I, the son of man, am. And his disciples turned to him because they, they heard the chatter throughout the communities and they responded to Jesus and they said, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the other prophets who are dead. Now, here's Jesus who's alive 
And some people were saying, you're one of those dead prophets. He's alive right in front of you. So what did Jesus do? He says, all right. He asked the question. He got the answers. He got the feedback. He, again, looked at his disciples and he says, whom do you say that I am? You're following me. Who do you believe that I am? He's speaking to them. You've witnessed the miracles. You've heard the teachings. You've heard the sermons on the mount. Who do you say that I am? You've heard all this speaking. You, you've been to church. You've been to Sunday school. You've sat in the pew. Maybe you've occupied the pulpit. Maybe you occupied the teacher position. Who do you say Jesus is as he speaks to you? Peter, being the spokesperson. Peter says, Thou art the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the Christ, the one sent from the Father to be the Savior of the world. You are Emmanuel. Peter responded. Jesus responds to him. Flesh and blood have not revealed that unto you, but my Father which art in heaven. Jesus said, Peter, and this is my words, Peter, the Father spoke to you. You heard him. You accepted what he told you, and therefore you responded truthfully that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. So God spoke to Peter. Peter accepted what God said. And from the abundance of Peter's heart, Peter's mouth spoke the truth. And Jesus responded again in that conversation. Jesus says, and upon that rock, he wasn't talking about Peter that the church is going to be built on. Upon that rock, that truth, that solid foundation that he is the Christ, the statement that was revealed to Peter from the Father concerning Jesus, upon that rock, upon that truth, I will build my church. The church being men and women, you and I, brothers and sisters. The point I'm making there, as God spoke to Peter, Peter responded to Jesus. God speaks to us, but we must be humble enough to hear God and remove anything that uh, we may think or what have you but just to be humble enough to hear the voice of God as it is in alignment with the word of God, accept it to be true. And we know when we accept it to be true because from the abundance of our heart, the mouth is going to speak. God speaks to us through his son, Jesus, who is the word of God. It is up to us. It is dependent upon us to lay aside pride and to accept God's word. Accept God's word and measure our lives on the word of God. Traditions, some traditions are wonderful. They should not be removed. They should not be taken away. But there are some traditions that need to be abolished. Ritualistic traditions of just going through the motions, my opinion, should be abolished because they could be doing more damage in the hearts and lives of people than good. God speaks to us. God is speaking to us through his word. I encourage each and every one of you under the sound of my voice who will hear this at a later time, review it or what have you. Look to God through his word. Allow the word of God to stimulate your prayer life. Allow the word of God to motivate you to draw closer to Jesus. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away. 
This is the truth. This is what Jesus said. But not one jot or one tittle of my word shall ever. It is eternal. What was he referring to? He's referring to himself. He says, heaven and earth may pass away. But I am the word of God and I am eternal. Trust in me. Believe in me. Build your life upon me, upon that solid rock. It is the cure for depression. It is the cure for discouragement. Your money, my money, uh, throwing money at different things is not the cure, is not the fix. Stimulus checks are not the fix. Jesus is the fix. Let me just go current here. Jesus is the fix for homelessness. Jesus is the fix for our e economic crisis. Jesus is the fix for COVID. Jesus is the fix for gas prices. Jesus is the fix for all these situations we face globally, nationally, and personally. It's when we start looking to other people and other things. God goes on the shelf and the problems remain and our souls are troubled. But if your soul is troubled today or will be troubled in the future, go to Jesus. He's the bomb in Gilead. He's the bomb for your life and my life. He is the solution. He is the fix. He will not fail. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Will you believe that?